things that I had to deal with being the front man for this band is the thought that there might be more people in this room that are interested in hearing from me than there are in who are interested in hearing from Don. And listen, that's not like that's not a pride thing, man. That's something that's broken my heart. That's something that I've wept about. I think that people will come to one of our shows and want to hear some dude talk about his band. Or somebody sing some song that they wrote when the God of all creation is longing desperately to speak to you. Amen. And that lumps us in with just every other ridiculous distraction that we waste our lives on. And I want you to know, I want you to know, man, that, that it's, and it's not coming soon. I love this job. It's an honor and a privilege and a blessing. I'm so thankful to God for what he's given us in, in this band. But I want you to know that the day he calls us away from it, it's going to be a huge relief for me. Because sometimes I feel like I'm way more of a distraction than I am a help. And listen, I want you to understand, like when I stand up here and talk, it's not for my own health, it's not because it's my band's gimmick, it's because I, I, I legitimately believe that God is speaking to you. That no matter who you are, how you were raised, no matter how you were brought up, what, what your, 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 your church beliefs are, that, that the God that made you is speaking to you right now. And he's speaking something unique to every single one of you. And he's calling you higher. He's calling you up to where he is. And I don't ever want any of you to get distracted because there's some band playing by, or get distracted by, by some dude on stage yelling at you because that's not what this is about. I want you to hear the voice inside the voice. If I say something that's true and it resonates with your spirit, I want you to hear it with your ears and hear it with your spirit. I want you to hear that God is speaking right now if you're willing to listen. So... So listen, as we were playing that last song, and I, you know, there's a lot of a lot of true things that I could say, a lot of provoking things that I could say, and I I, I heard God just say, just tell them what you've seen, because I think that y'all have heard a lot, but I think there are a lot of people in this room that haven't seen much. You know that, that you've heard on the radio and on TV and from bands and from your grandma and whatever that Jesus died for your sins, right? We know that. I'm supposed to live my life for him. Yeah, I know I'm a Christian. I pray this prayer and I go to church and, and I do all that. I've heard all of that. But what have you really seen? The invitation that God extends is, is, is that we would taste and see that he is good. That I wouldn't just hear it through the grapevine. It wouldn't be something that somebody else said, something I read in some book that I just believed and decided to live my life based on. It would be something that I have seen for real, that I have experienced and encountered for myself. So... <laughs> So listen, bear with me. This is this is like my story, man. There, and, and I believe that I was a Christian before this, but after this moment, there was no going back for me. There was a time I was in a, in a city in, in Indiana, and we had an off day. The people we were staying with um, were these awesome Christian people, and uh, and, and the woman said, I'm, I'm going to go to our church uh, and just unlock it and turn on some worship music and just soak. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, and so I said, what does that mean? That's a good way to find out what things mean is by asking you know, so I said, I said, what does that, what does that mean? And she said, uh, I'm just going to go and just invite God's presence to just hang out with Him. And I said, okay, this sounds totally weird. Let's, I'll try anything once. Let's do it. You know. So I show up in this church and I'm sitting in the pew. There's like three people in the room. She's playing just terrible worship music. It's not nothing. It's not like all the stars aligned. I wasn't worked up in some emotional frenzy. I was, I was sitting there and I was thinking, you know, I've heard people talk about seeking the face of God. And I don't know what that means. So I sat there. This is how I went about seeking the face of God. And I said, God, I'm seeking your face. <laughs> Profound, right? And I'm like focusing on it. <laughs> and it just, it, it goes from this like fabricated thing where I'm just reciting what I've heard other people say to, to me just saying, God, I just want to be with you. Like more than anything else. I don't want you to give me money. I don't want you to come heal me. I don't, I don't want you to do anything for me. I just want to be with you. And, uh, and, and I'm going to do the best that I can to explain this. It was like suddenly everything tangible fell below me. Or, or like I was suddenly lifted up. I really couldn't tell you which one. My, my eyes were closed. And in the spirit, it was like everything in the church, the music that was there, the chair I was sitting in, the floor underneath me, the walls around me, everything just, and it was gone. And, and I, was, I was in... This, it was like a white room with no walls. There was a, there was a ceiling, there was a floor, and it just went forever and ever. And, and the, the, the light source, it was like 
all around me. It was this like blinding white light, and I couldn't see anything. It was hard for my eyes to adjust, and uh, and and I just kind of stunned. By, you know, I, I, I sat there, and I, as my eyes got got focused, I saw that there was like a silhouette of, of a man walking toward me, and uh, and as it got closer, I I was able to see. I'm sorry. I, I guess I was able to know in my spirit that it was Jesus. It wasn't like like I couldn't sit down and draw a picture of him, honestly. Uh, but, but 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 he walked up to me and I and I, I like I saw Jesus and he came up with this smile and he said, "I'm so glad you're here. I've been preparing a place for you. Come, let me show you." And uh, and he held his hand out to me and um, and I I grabbed his hand and uh, and as as I reached for his hand, I noticed that there was a hole through it. And then as, as I, I paid more attention, I noticed that there were scars all up his arms and on his, his neck and his back and, and even up onto his head. And, uh, and, and he, he kind of tried to pull me to, to follow him. And I hesitated for a minute and I just ran my finger over the hole in his hand. And I said, I, I said, did it hurt? And, uh, and then he, he kind of stopped and he turned back and he looked at me. And then he looked around at this like beautiful, perfect you told me that we were standing and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, it was worth it. That's right. That's right. And I, I was sitting in this church, I don't know how long I was sitting in this church when this happened, uh, but I just lost it. Like, I was sobbing like a baby, like all day. I called my my wife, who was then my fiance at the time, and told her and got about 10 words into the story and just cried for like half an hour and was just undone for for, for days or weeks after that. It, it stunned me because because Jesus on the cross, we've all seen that picture, we've all seen paintings of that, we know that. that. That we understand he was broken, he died for our sins, right? Everybody in America knows that Jesus died for our sins, right? What does that even mean? But but for me to be standing with him, and then for him to look at me and say it was worth it, so blew my mind. Because he didn't just die for our sins because that's just the luck of the draw. He died for my sins because he chose to die for my sins. He says, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Everything that happened for him, happened to him on that cross, on the way to that cross, even after that cross. That Jesus, as he was tasting death, as he was drinking the cup of God's wrath, was thinking, this is all worth it. Because he loves you that much. Because he loves me that much. Because through through the, the, the generations across the earth, that, that, that even across the expanse of human history, he saw me and my depravity and my brokenness. And while I was still a sinner, he died for me. That while I was still a sinner, he said, I'll take that wrath so that Maddie Montgomery doesn't have to. I'll take that wrath so that there can be hope for anybody that would be willing to follow me. And I just want you to understand, man, that, that, that so many people try to paint a picture of Jesus as being this like sad, pathetic, weak, insignificant, insecure, broken man. But I, I need you to understand that when he was hanging on that cross, he was winning for you the greatest victory anyone could ever achieve. He was claiming victory over hell itself and over death itself. Amen. And the Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And so when I look out into this room and I see a bunch of people that come to Christian shows and they clap when dudes talk about Jesus. Right? Maybe you got some Christian band t-shirts. Maybe you got some Bible verses on your Facebook. When I look out into this room, I don't see a bunch of Christian kids. I see the joy that was set before him. When I look out into this room, I see something that Jesus thought was worth facing hell for. When I look out into this room and I see your faces, I see something that the God of all creation thought was so precious and so beautiful that he would send his only son to earth to be scorned and murdered. To be dishonored and disrespected and utterly destroyed to save you. 
Now listen, there are a lot of people that have a good understanding of what we have to do as Christians. Well, I have to not have sex before marriage. I have to not cuss. I have to not whatever, you know? But if I feel like if you really understand what Jesus did for you, then maybe it wouldn't be like a list of chores you have to cross off every day. Then maybe it would be a joy to honor Him with your life. Then maybe you would say, it's the least I can do to give Him everything. He gave everything for me. Then maybe you would say, of course He gets it all. I love Him. Of course I love Him. He loves me first. So, so it's not. I'm talking way too long. This is not nearly like hype and metal enough for metal shows. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, Keep it up. But listen, I, I, I don't want to invite you to be a part of my religion. I don't want to invite you to join my club or to read my book. None of that stuff sounds exciting to me. I want to invite you to, to, to express with your life that you are in love with Jesus. Listen, when I sit next to strangers on a plane, it's not, it's not unusual for me to bust out pictures of my wife and son and show them how awesome my family is because I love them. But how much more rare is it for a Christian to bring up Jesus on a plane, right? But if you love him, it would just be natural. Well, where do you live, man? Well, I live in I live in Alabama. Oh, what do you got going on in Alabama? Well, you know, part of this church, man, we just love Jesus. Do you know him? It's easy. Listen, I do it all the time. It's easy to slip Jesus into a conversation with a stranger. It's not that hard. Suck it up and do it. <laughs> yeah, we, still, we still got a few more songs, but uh, I don't listen. I'm not gonna like make you come up front or raise your hand or like perform anything. I just want to tell you this: that if, if Jesus does not get your every moment, He's not the King of your life. If Jesus does not get your every day, He's not the King of your life. If Jesus does not get every word you speak, every thought you think, if He doesn't get it all, then you're denying Him what He deserves. What he paid for on the cross. And so listen, I, if you really love him, then I dare you to really love him. You get what I'm saying? Amen. If you really love him, then I dare you to really, really, really love him. And don't, don't ever be afraid of what your friends are going to think. Don't ever be afraid of, of losing relationships, of losing social status, because anything you lose for his sake you'll find so much more in his kingdom, I promise. So I'm, in, I'm inviting, no, I'm not even inviting you, I'm daring you. There's not a person in this room, atheist or Christian, church kid or Satanist, that doesn't know what a life fully devoted to the cause of Christ looks like. Everybody knows what a real Christian should look like. So I'm daring you to suck it up and show the world what they've been longing to see. Real Christian young people who are fully devoted in the place of prayer, who are consecrated and wholly set apart unto God, who pray for the sick and see them recover, who preach the gospel to strangers and advance the kingdom at all costs. I dare you to show the world what it's been begging for. Real devotion from real Christians who really know the God that they serve and know who they are because they know the one that made them. And listen, maybe nobody in this place is willing to answer the call. But I'm willing to extend it. Now suck it up. Who in this place is willing to answer the call of a radical devotion to Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I hope you understand this means laying your life down. You might die for this. And we're getting closer, friend. You might get denied jobs for this. And I promise you will lose friends for this. It's not going to be good for your 401k. It's not going to be good for your social status or for the likes on your Facebook pictures. But friend, I'm telling you, it's going to save people from the fires of hell. And there is nothing more glorious than that. So if you're with me, let me hear your voice right now.